Can someone confirm in the chat that we can start the webinar now? Okay, thank you. Colleagues, can you hear me now? Okay, thanks. So good afternoon, colleagues, uh, and welcome to the webinar on Nourishing Adolescents in Mozambique, Current Investments in Adolescent Nutrition. Before we start, I would like to give some brief housekeeping instructions and an explanation. Um, on the webinar today, simultaneous translation is available. I think we lost Dorothy. I think she's just dropped out. Uh, Nadia, would you mind taking over, please, whilst we reconnect with Dorothy? Yes. So we have, as Dorothy was saying, we have um, a translator. We have in both languages. Uh, you need to press the uh, interpretation um, tab here in the bottom. So you can choose either to hear it in Portuguese or English. All uh, participants will be uh, muted. Um, and um, I'm not sure if I'm forgetting any of the house rules. I think we're pretty good, Nadia. We should be uh, ready to introduce our speakers for today. Sure. So I was going to uh, introduce uh, Dorothy Foot. Um, uh, she was the person that was previously speaking. She's the nutrition manager at UNICEF Mozambique. She'll be our moderator. Let's hope she can come in as soon as possible. Um, and uh, next is uh, Saul Morris. Uh, he's the Director of Program Services at GAIN. He's going to be one of the presenters. Then the next presenter will be Dr. Vitor Sitão, um, Public Health Specialist at the Nutrition Department at the Ministry of Health. And then uh, we have uh, Nadia Osman, that's me. Uh, I'm a senior nutrition specialist uh, who was leading uh, GAIN's work on adolescent nutrition in Mozambique. That was between 2018 and 2021. And then we, ha we will have uh, the next presenter will be um, uh, uh, Delaide Liquidão. Uh, she's the program analyst for youth and COVID-19 response at UN UNFPA. And our last speaker will be uh, Leonor Vitor. She's a technical director for Transform Nutrition Project, a USAID funded project uh, in Ampula province. And uh, Leonor is from ADPP, who is the lead prime uh, in the consortium that is uh, managing and implementing the Transform Nutrition. So after the presentation, we will have uh, some space, 15 minutes for questions uh, and um, and answers and we will we will ask um, the participants to please post your um, your questions in the uh, Q&A chat box we will not have time to answer all questions so we will select some of the questions to be able by our panelists by your speakers so do please uh, if there's a question that is directed to one of the speakers do please mention it in your question and then we will finalize the, uh, the webinar with the conclusions and final considerations that will be done by our um, moderator. So to start with, I will now share um, the... Um, um, should I switch to, uh, to Portuguese? If, if you wish, Nadia, we have interpretation. Se quiser falar português, não tem problema. If you wish to speak Portuguese, that's no problem. Okay, so I would like to hand over to Mr. Saul Morris. He is head of program services at GAIN. 
and Mr. Morris is going to give us a presentation on the importance and recommendations on nutrition for adolescents. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Saul Morris. I am the head of program services at GAIN. And this presentation includes some concepts thanks to the contribution by Drs. Lynette Lanford and George Patton. We all know that there are some nutritional interventions that are important for adolescents, namely adolescent girls. We are familiar, for example, with the importance of iron supplementation and also folic acid supplementation. Notwithstanding, these interventions are often done to prepare the adolescent girls for their futures as mothers. And these interventions don't necessarily consider what's important for their current life or their future. For example, many adolescent girls are in their school years, so we ought to prioritize the nutritional interventions in order to optimize their capacity to concentrate during class and also improve their cognitive achievements. Teenage the adolescent girls are often very skinny and they probably suffer from a lack of energy, which is a problem. Fortunately, Mozambique isn't particularly affected by this phenomenon. However, the tendency is for it to get worse. The prevalence of anemia is higher and it can affect more than a quarter of adolescent girls in many Southern African countries. Anemia isn't a problem which only affects adolescent girls, it also affects adolescent boys. But it's not widely discussed because obviously the boys aren't prepared to be future mothers. So maybe the most important aspect of adolescent nutrition is to create good dietary habits. So what adolescents enjoy in terms of food at this point of their life is something that will perpetuate for decades. So these preferences will dictate and determine their risk of chronic disease later in life. They often enjoy soft drinks and unhealthy snacks, and these are habits that people pick up in their adolescent years. And this often leads to an increase in weight and obesity. And these problems are increasingly important in our context. So what can we do to halt these tendencies? It's important to have some reference material such as this WHO guideline, but it's also worth highlighting that this document represents evidence collected from other age groups. It isn't a summary based on research focused on adolescents, because more often than not, the specific research hasn't it doesn't exist so take a look at this table with regards to interventions specific for adolescents it's very difficult to create a comprehensive policy based on such little evidence and it's true that the last table i showed you was published a few years ago but unfortunately the last years haven't improved very much in this sense. So we need some evidence based on the unique aspects regarding adolescence. For example, they have a very intense relationship with the media. So how can we explore this relationship with the media, namely digital media? 
for our nutrition programs. So adolescents spend a large portion of their time at school. So what are the aspects of the school curricula which are most useful to change nutrition habits? It's also a time in life when they start to prepare for entering the job market. And so how can we take advantage of this transition period? Today, we have the privilege of having some colleagues who are going to tell us about issues related to all of these essential elements in adolescence and how we can best explore them to create innovative programs for adolescents. We also have evidence from other countries. Recently, the Adolescent Nutrition Resource Bank was launched by the USAID Advancing Nutrition Project. And on this website, you can learn more and read a wide range of documents related to advocacy, for example, capacity building, monitoring, evaluation, and social and behavior changes. In the past month, in the next months of this year, the Lancet is going to publish a document on adolescent growth and nutrition. And we're finally going to have a comprehensive summary on issues regarding adolescent nutrition. And this is going to undoubtedly help us in creating more better policies and more effective policies. So valuable experience in adolescent nutrition is important. And we are able to obtain this from work carried out in different regions within the country. At the same time, we are also finally going to be able to see a published article based on evidence on adolescent nutrition. Perhaps it would be timely to bring together all the experts and begin to trace a national strategy and devise a plan for nutritional adolescents in Mozambique. What do you guys think of that? Thank you very much. It was a huge pleasure to be with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. So next we will have the presentation from Dr. Victor Sital, and this is on the theme um, two, uh, which is adolescent nutrition in Mozambique, current situation, policies and investments in adolescent nutrition in the past five years. So this presentation will be given by Dr. Victor Sital, Public Health Specialist, Nutrition Department, Ministry of Health. Over to you, Victor. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Vitor Sitel, and I'm here on behalf of the Nutrition Department of the Ministry of Health of Mozambique. My presentation today is an overview of the current situation, policies, and investment in nutrition program for adolescents in Mozambique. Let me start by giving you some context, specifically relating to what adolescence is. Adolescence represents a transition period between childhood and adulthood, and it stands out due to strong changes, especially related to the body of these um, groups, as well as their uh, emotional development. However, the WHO defines the adolescence as the period of life of these youngsters between 10 and 19, and then subdivide them in three 
further phases. So we have pre-adolescence, adolescence, and youth. Adolescents in Mozambique are the ones which are growing the fastest. They represent 50% of the population in line with figures uh, in the 2017 survey and census. However, despite this growth, it suffers the so-called triple burden of malnutrition. Indeed, 23% of girls suffer from chronic malnutrition. That is also uh, a great number of people, of youngsters who are overweight or obese. And then there is a lack of micronutrients. And this is a worrying problem, especially among young girls between 15 and 19. And let's not even talk about anemia. A study which was carried out in 2017, we found out that 33% th that within a household, a girl represents 33% of the cost needed to provide for nutrition in the household. What has Mozambique done in the last years to protect this group? Well, it has done very different things. The first that I'd like to mention is the multi-sectoral chronic malnutrition reduction plan. Its main objective is that of boosting the activities which have an impact on the nutritional uh, well-being of adolescents. Within objective one, they speak to the, rather they address anemia, wanting to bring it down. They will also want to bring down early um, pregnancies. And they also want to boost nutrition programs within the entire school syllabus. In this document, we also have objective number four, the distribution of uh, funds for those families with adolescents, especially the low income ones, so that they can have a more diverse nutrition. This was the matter Mozambique. What about the international perspective? We have the global accelerated action for the health of adolescents. This roadmap focuses on one main topic, i.e. to stop all types of, of malnutrition and to meet the demands vis-a-vis -vis nutrition of children, of adolescents, of pregnant women and of breastfeeding women. So what is the, so what has Mozambique done at the government level? Together with the Ministry of Health and Education, the local government has already been implementing this program, i.e. girls between the age of 10 and 19 receive iron and folic acid supplements in all of the uh, in all the schools, and schools also carry out deworming programs. There's also different programs such as the La Pariga Bees program, which aims to stop early pregnancies. And then what about uh, another program is the Transform Nutrition. Transform Nutrition affects the northern region, specifically Nampula municipality. But this project aims to be extended to other parts of the country, but the main target group are teenagers, i.e. adolescents. Now, despite the softest programs, we still suffer from a big number of challenges. There are different studies that have been carried out. But many times, these studies focus on young adolescent women, but the sample is very small. And this is an issue because Mozambique is a large country, and therefore sometimes these data aren't as uh, effective as they should be. That means that analysis should be carried out more and more often in larger sample group. Another challenge that we have is that we do not have a strategic nutritional plan for adolescents. And so the MISAU, i.e. the Ministry of Health, together with its partners, had decided to outline such a um, plan, roadmap, guidelines to target this target group, and has done so by implementing different investment measures. In conclusion, we've talked about the challenges, 
And based on these challenges, we've talked that we have to do a lot more across all of the country when it comes to nutritional programs for children and for adolescents. And this can only be done by carrying out more studies, which are qualitative and quantitative in nature to really implement a uh, transversal program for our adolescents. In, at the end of 2021, Lancet will publish global guidelines to improve the nutritional state of adolescents. Of adolescents. So we can really use these strategic guidelines and leverage them so that the global directives can also be used at a national level. Another idea for that would be that of creating a task force to implement said guidelines. Thank you very much for listening. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sital. Um, our next presentation is on theme three, which is nourishing Erolinas in Mozambique, understanding, designing with, and tailoring nutrition interventions for adolescent girls. This presentation is being given by Dr. Nadia Osman. She's a senior nutrition specialist who led GAIN adolescent nutrition work in Mozambique between 2018 and 2021. Over to you, Nadia. Boa tarde, sou a Nadia Osman e vou apresentar o trabalho que a GAIN fez para o projeto Nutrindo. Good afternoon, I'm going to present the work that GAIN did for nutrition for heroines, nourishing heroines. This project had some financing from the Netherlands and the USAID as well. So what do we know about teenage girls and teenage adolescents in general? It's a time of social cognitive development that takes place very quickly and it establishes pillars for their health and nutrition for the rest of their life. They aren't children or adults, but they still need and require some playtime, they like to make their decisions and choose their future, they form their opinions, so they're very influenced, and it's an opportunity to consolidate good, healthy eating habits for the rest of their life. And to do this, we need to develop some interventions which are relevant to them and also to their context. These interventions have to be engaging, motivational, be able to persuade them, it has to have a certain appeal. And it, we need to focus on what they want and also make sure that they can help change their behavior. And the only way in which we can do this is by involving them in the design process. Unfortunately, more often than not, that's not how we design the nutrition interventions based on time or financing. So the project Nourishing Eroinas had the aim of promoting healthy eating habits in adolescents, namely adolescent girls. And we wanted to co-design some interventions that we could integrate into the existing programs, such as Rakaparibagabis, the Action for Girls. So the target was for girls between 10 and 19 years of age and their mothers. And we focused on the Nampula province. So we created this implementation and we used the HCD methodology, human centered design, and we underwent different phases. So basic research in urban and rural areas, then phase two, the ideation and co-design. Phase three was split in two parts, one to test the prototypes and then to fine tune the prototypes and test them again. Phase four, we finalized the interventions, namely the Eroinas game and the Wapaya Academy. And then we tested this in a pilot program with the Action for Girls, Rapariga Big. And then we redesigned this for phase six, and now we're doing a scale up in the project Transform Nutrition, which has financing from USAID. And so 
we reached a number of conclusions after phase one. I'm going to share a few. So these findings were used to then define the interventions. For example, we realized that the girls didn't have the decision power over what they ate. This power was in the hands of their parents, namely their mothers. So any intervention that we wanted to design, it would be very important that we involved their mothers in these interventions. And we also saw that they didn't have a large variety of recipes and it's important to vary recipes often because otherwise they get tired of the same taste of food and the girls at the only moment in time in which they could decide what they ate was when they were at school their parents would give them some money some mozambique and medical one or two and with their friends they would buy some food from the informal sellers some little snacks or drinks such as soft drinks but we also noted that they hardly ever chose healthy options. In terms of consumption, there were some gaps that we identified as opportunities. So for example, it was very normal for them not to skip breakfast. And so they would eat vegetables, but not varied vegetables and not very many vegetables. So the vegetables were added to their plate just to add a little bit of color. And the same applies to beans. And Nampula is a large producer of beans, but they didn't consume them as often as they could have. And also, um, they only ate fruits during the mango season. And so we defined that some small doable actions for the adolescent girls and in all of the other interventions this was based on promoting the doable actions so phase two was the ideation and co-design phase we carried out workshops in Nacalaporto in Monapu and then we tried to reach a consensus on different opinions and we asked a number of questions from the research. So such as like, what do you consider healthy diet? And then we launched some design challenges. So how can we increase the number of green vegetables and, and beans consumed in families? And so the participants tried to seek out some solutions for these designs challenges and we decided on the best ideas and they were further developed by the participants. So phase three was the design and testing the prototypes. So we selected the best ideas that we could work on and, that, and which the girls had worked on and their parents. And then we designed three prototypes. And by prototypes, I mean ideas that are a certain level of being in that so we could test it. So we tested it in the field. We saw the results. We came back to the field. And so we had three prototypes which we then tested and we selected four, which we thought were the best. So it was the Wapay Academy, the Heroin Game, and some work with some informal sellers who would sell the, the snacks at the school gates. And so we wanted to make these snacks a bit healthier and more appealing for the adolescents. In, during the second round, we redesigned three of these prototypes, so the ones that are highlighted in yellow, and we tested them again. And in our fourth phase, we finalized two of them. So the Heroines Game and the Wapaya Academy was maintained based on the results of round two of phase three of the prototypes. So what is the Heroines Game? It was based on gamification and each week the girls would receive a little booklet with some challenges related to healthy eating and not only healthy eating. And as they complete the challenges, they receive a gift to motivate them. And the gifts were beads and lucky charms, which they could put onto their bracelets. And the Wapaya Academy 
the cooking academy was designed to revolutionize the cuisine via some sessions where they would learn new skills and variety of recipes to be able to do the matabishu, an alcoholic be beverage, and some snacks using vegetables and beans and also fish. And we also involve their mothers because at the end of the day, they have the decision power on what is cooked in the kitchen. So everything that they learned in the kitchen, we wanted the mothers to implement at home. And the participants could also take home the leftovers so other members of the family could indulge in trying them and their fathers as well, because oftentimes it's the father who defines what's going to be eaten at home. Here we have some photographs of the Eroines game. So you can see the lucky charms and the beads I mentioned. We had a number of different lucky charms, some were a little bit more rare. And the girls never knew which lucky charm they would be awarded. It was a surprise. So this made them more interested. So they wanted to perform even more challenges because they like certain lucky charms. So you can see these rare ones where I'm pointing to with my mouse. And so they would swap the lucky charms and the beads between themselves. And it was something that they enjoyed doing. And here you can see the booklets. They would receive a little book every week with the obligatory challenges. So change some sort of behavior. So eat more fruit or cook a recipe with green leaves, vegetables, or have a matabishu, the alcoholic beverage that I mentioned. And also they had to do some challenges to research and other challenges such as for the girls to wear capulanas, which is a sarong to school, or be able to put plaits in their hair. So some fun challenges so, so that they could get more excited about the project and have more intervention on their part. We also created different levels, so the girls would have to make a certain effort and have some competition between the girls. You can see the posters that the facilitators show them. It's very visual. And this is the box the game comes in. And the girls also received an invitation at the beginning of the game, so they would enjoy this intervention. And so the, the first session involved as many people as possible. So here you have the heroine with three different girls, and they each had their power. So Princess Sophia, the Spider Woman, and Snake Woman. And when they start the game, so before she becomes a princess, for where I'm pointing now, when they complete the game, they would receive another lucky charm and she was trans be transformed into a princess so princess sophia and the cooking academy where pia would have devised a cooking a recipe book with 38 recipes um we gave some value added to this academy so we created some branding a participation a certificate for participation and we trained the facilitators so we created an academy in the true sense of the word. So people would feel that they could do something different after they completed this training. And another value added proposal that we did is perhaps create some franchising, which the facilitators could then roll out and earn extra income. You can see some more photographs of the girls participating and carrying out and doing the recipes. And in the fifth phase, we tested these two interventions in four groups of the Rapadiga Big, the Action for Girls initiative, and also their mothers participated in the Cooking Academy, Wapaya Academy. So we implemented the Cooking Academy in 12 sessions over 12 weeks, but we had some barriers with the Heroinas game, so we only implemented six over 12 weeks. And we noted that for the number of the sessions, the average number of sessions was very high. And we also noted a high participation part 
of the girls in the cooking academy, but the mother's participation was lower than expected. And after we spoke to the families, we realized that it was difficult for the girls and the mothers to be out of the home at the same time. And in phase six, we redesigned it for the heroines game and the cooking academy. So, for example, we noted that to do 10 challenges a week was too much. It was hard for them to be able to plan to complete so many challenges. And the sessions between the mentors and the girls was very long, so we reduced it to four a week. And also the fact that we gave them bracelets to put on their lucky charms was a problem because the bracelets the bracelets snapped easily because they're always they were always busy, so they had their hands immersed in water to wash dishes and so on. So the bracelets would snap easily, and so we changed it to necklaces. And then the parents weren't very interested or didn't participate, and so we added the fact that the parents would have to double check the challenges. And now we're at phase seven, the scale up phase within the Transform Nutrition Project. And this is being carried out in 12 districts across Nampola. In terms of lessons learned and recommendations, the use of gamification meant that the heroism game that was able to be adapted to other behavior, and we adapted the heroines game to behavior such as hygiene and sanitation. It can be applied in a rural or urban context. It can be adapted to different provinces, not only to Nampula. It can also be adapted to boys. We tailored it for girls, but it can easily be adjusted for boys. And it can be adapted as well to facilitators who aren't as well trained. So we initially designed it for the Rapadiga Bs, the Action for Girls mentors, but for Transform Nutrition, we saw that it's important to simplify it for the facilitator girls who have a low level of literacy. And it's a really fun intervention. The girls really like to participate in it. And more than anything else, it promotes behavior and it isn't simply knowledge dumping. And so this idea of identifying behavior which they can carry out is important, even with the limitations that they face of low income, low levels of literacy, they haven't got a wide access to a huge range of foodstuffs. And because of these limitations, it's very important to involve the adolescents in the design process because we have to do the interventions with them and for them. So it's important that we're all on the same page and that they're at the center of the design process. And we also saw that nutrition isn't a priority for the adolescents. So it's important to incorporate nutrition and nutrition interventions within existing programs, which focus on their priorities and needs. And future initiatives as well should include boys. So define design interventions with boys for boys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Osman, and that was a very interesting presentation. I just want to point out to our participants that there will be a link shared in the chat box now um, with some papers that have been written about the Erwinish uh, game and development. So please, um, please do bookmark and, and check that link and um, look at those documents. Uh, when you have some time. But for now, uh, we are going to move on to our next presentation, which is on theme four. Uh, it is called Building Nutrition Interventions on Existing Adolescent Platforms Program. This presentation will be given by Adelaide Lukudal. She is the Program Analyst for Youth and COVID-19 Response at UNFPA here in Mozambique. So thank you, and over to you, Adelaide. 
região que este apresenta para a integração de outras companhias. Muito obrigado. Thank you very much. I will talk about Rapariga Bees is a sexual and reproductive health program and rights for adolescent girls. It is an initiative of the government of Mozambique and it is implemented and coordinated by the Ministry of Youth and Employment, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Action and the Ministry of Education and Human uh, Development. And then, of course, there are four UN agencies, the UNESCO, the UNFPA, UNICEF, and UN Women. Why is this so interesting? Because it is the first UN joint program, which was developed and targets women. Our aim, or the aim of the program, is that the sexual health and the rights of young women in two provinces of Mozambique is fully realized via empowerment, allowing them to make better choices and better access sexual and reproductive health services. The objective is that of reaching around 1 million young women between and girls between the age of 10 and 24 years. It will last for four years. But we want to improve the coverage. The current picture shows you the structure, the approaches, and also the extension of the Rapariga Biz program. As you can see from this slide, this program has solid foundations when it comes to its acceptance by the community. And it is acknowledged by it. It is a holistic program and it also integrates different interventions. It has coherent and structured approaches and these approaches are also safe and sustainable. It rests on a solid foundation and it includes mentoring groups and it can count on approximately 5,000 mentors. These mentors are well-trained, they are leaders and they are problem solvers and they are acknowledged by the community. And on top of that, the mentees also recognize their importance and see them in a positive light. So all of these elements can be leveraged in a positive manner to then be implemented in other programs such as nutritional programs. We believe that the whole mentoring aspect is really the best solution for nutritional programs. Why is that? These mentoring sessions are carried out once a week in a safe area. Every mentor follows between 25 and 30 mentees. However, Mentorship is not the only format that can be used. We have TV and radio broadcasts, such as Oro Negro and Inch Tuntades. We also have the SMS Biz platform. We have community dialogue. We have economic empowerment and health fairs. So all of these elements and approaches can be used to really empower the whole program. Generally speaking, we can say that we have to capitalize the investment made in Mozambique for those sexual and reproductive health programs by integrating new elements such as nutritional projects or programs, i.e. in other words, let's use nutritional programs and let's feed them into already existing program programs which have a very strong history in the country. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much, Adelaide, for this interesting presentation. And speaking of presentations, let's move on to the next one, held by Leonor Victor. She will be talking about the uh, Transform Nutrition Project and the Heroina Games intervention. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Leonor Victor. I am the Techno Director for Transform Nutrition. 
I will be talking about the implementation of the heroinage game in the Transform Nutrition project. Transform Nutrition. It's same as that of improving the nutritional results of 118,000 pregnant and breastfeeding women, 260,000 adolescent girls, and 165,000 uh, girls who are not older than two years of age. Now, the coverage uh, is uh, 12 districts across the region of Nampula. The aim is that of creating and boosting nutritional groups, that of creating girl clubs, so-called girl clubs that I will be talking about in a bit. We also want to support the implementation of nutritional interventional packages. We also want to support and boost hygiene as well as boost the co-management committees. How do we improve adolescent nutrition? This project has some very clear objectives. Let's start with the girls club. There are 316 clubs up until now. In these groups, we have two leader girls who will support us in carrying out these activities once a week in the different groups. That is, they create and uh, administer these heroines games that last for 16 weeks. And every week they uh, create some challenges, challenges which need to be um, solved back at home. And the leader girl looks at the feedback and whether the girls manage to solve the challenge the next week. And if they do, they receive a present as a way of motivating them. They also supervise debates. And there are also videos. These videos are then shared in the communities. When it comes to the objectives of the nutritional, uh, when it comes to the girls club sessions, the objectives are that are promoting new nutritional habits, which are healthy, they also aim to improve health, nutrition, hygiene, and reproductive sexual health knowledge of these girls by creating uh, workshops and debates. They also want to improve communication within and outside of the household. Currently, there are 317 leader girls and we'll be training many more in the following years. Currently, we have these sessions across nine districts. When it comes to these sessions, we saw that when it comes to Transform Nutrition and to other programs, we have already received feedback that these sessions are incredibly productive and they are interactive and entertaining as well. So it's the best of both worlds. As you can see from the pictures, you have one of the challenges that was created. There are different challenges, as I said. We also have to face our challenges, i.e. finding the right girls that can become the leaders. And how do they become girl leaders in these groups? We have to create these documents so they can be trained. And that's what we have done. We also have created an online platform. However, let's not forget that sometimes internet access can be very heterogeneous. And so that can create some problems in accessing this platform that we have created. And sometimes it's also difficult to meet them during the weekend. They can only meet during the weekend. This is one of the Jogueruinas sessions. Thank you very much. And I will await for further questions and um, 
debates. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. So um, now I believe we are going on to the question and answer session. So again, a very hearty thank you to all of our presenters. Um, we have received some questions in the Q&A box. And first, we will start by um, responding to some of the questions um, that have been posted there. So one of the questions from the Q&A box was for Dr. Morris. And was this, Un dos mayores desafíos que encontramos al One of the largest challenges we noticed is the limited available information. How can we obtain the statistics on this subject for adolescent nutrition? Thank you for the question. It's a very good question and very relevant question right now because Mozambique is designing a national strategy for adolescent nutrition. So when I think about the data that we need to create this kind of strategy, I think we would need the nutritional status of the adolescents, the relevant practices, so the economic activity, what kind of production do they participate in, or teaching activities and educational activities. It's important to know what kind of food they are eating and drinking and their beliefs to be able to develop strategies. And I think that this data exists in different research. So we have some research on families, one for health, one for data on the school system. And without a doubt, we have some information on the sale of different products in the country. So the problem isn't the existence of this data, it's more to do with the availability of this data, as the colleague who asked the question said. So we have two possible solutions to be able to obtain data which isn't public. So as UNICEF did about two years ago, they held a get together, a meeting for researchers, and each researcher presents the conclusions of their own research. And then they bring, collect all of the research together into one sole document or create a specific project with incentives for the researchers to analyze this data in a separate way for for data for example which is presented for whole family so these would be two existing possibilities in the sense of bringing together the researchers in the country who are focused on this area thank you for your question thank you dr morris is for Leonor, and um, this question is, Como magistora de proyecto, que tipo de As a project manager, what kind of recommendations do you need to define interventions of effective nutrition for adolescents? Thank you very much for all, to all of the participants. So with regards to what should be presented with regards to new projects and implementation, namely for adolescent nutrition, I think we have to identify some challenges to improve these interventions, such as the how we can reach the adolescents in schools. 
because the schools were closed down and so this affected the adolescents in the community so we have to engage with the ministry of education so the teachers have to implement and introduce curriculum based on nutrition and also have some connection with the sanitation with people who are responsible for sanitation and this is very important and we have a program for this but we have a challenge as to how we can reach a number of adolescents so it's important that we do this every month this is an important aspect and also we have to come together with other partners and other governmental agencies to have more interventions at a community level so the parents have to be involved as well and the community leaders the doulas as well to understand aspects of nutrition and how this can be implemented in their activities and at a family level thank you very much for your question thank you leonor for your answer questions then um okay we have one question for nadia during the heroinas project did you relate nutrition to agricultural production and could the adolescents learn how to produce something that's more nutritious in their family land Thank you for your question, Dorothy. No, we didn't um, include this agricultural aspect to it. So we were mainly focused on focusing on promoting healthy habits with what we already had at hand or with food that wasn't eaten very often by the adolescents. So we didn't think about this agricultural aspect and who often decides as to what's going to be planted and when it's going to be harvested are their parents they can participate but it's a very passive sort of participation obviously they will become mothers and they'll have their own families and their own gardens and, and orchards and so they would have to learn as to what they should plant and how they're going to be able to consume it in the household. But this would be an additional activity that for sure we can perhaps add on to our existing program. Okay, muito obrigada, Nadia. Um, Thank you, Nadia. I'd like to ask you to follow in the chat box if there are any questions there that you can answer live in writing, please go ahead. Um, and now I think we will move to the um, next question, which is for Victor, um, related to the uh, task force. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee. Um, concerning the recommendation for an adolescent nutrition task force brought by Dr. Sital's presentation, I would like to reiterate in support on the urgent need of having a discussion group aimed at congregating all initiatives in the country concerning this matter, as well as to gather, process, and digest all learnings and results obtaining from initiatives in the country, more factually and data-based advocacy for the national strategy or policy on adolescent nutrition. However, it is key that this congregation effort is led by MISAO to ensure buy-in from partners and multi-sector stakeholders. This would be the starting point to initiate the advocacy process. Is MISAO up for this challenge? Over to you, Dr. Sitao. Um, obrigado, Dorothy. Um, Thank you, Dorothy. And thank you for the anonymous, interesting question, namely at a point in time where there's a lot of interest and in this movement with, from donors and a huge concern on part of the government with regards to this 
group this of the adolescents. As I said in my presentation, this the government is very much focused on this group. They're very focused on them. And it's a group that is increasing in populational terms and represents the future of our country. And so the question is a very good question and posed at the right time, because as I said, more than a requirement to create a task force to bring all of this experience together and discuss this in more depth. So the idea of nutrition in adolescence, to be able to bring all these initiatives together that are going to that appear every so often and create some movement, a civil movement, so to say, to represent the adolescents in the country. This is absolutely fundamental. And this organization already exists in our country and it's head up by the SETSAN with different parties involved, the government's involved via its different ministries. So the Ministry for Education, Ministry for Health, Ministry for Gender, and other organizations which are a part of this larger organization to discuss this issue. But what we have to do now is revitalize this organization, this agency, so that we can begin these discussions, the roundtable discussions, and focus specifically on strategic aspects that can be carried out. So how can we take this forward? Although we already have some interventions working on this in different fronts, such as the Ministry of Health in coordination with the Ministry of Education, they do the folic acid supplementation in schools for teen adolescent girls, and the Ministry of Education via the Ministry for Youth and Sports for the Biz Generation these are all isolated initiatives but oftentimes this is because of the lack of funding to be able to create something which is more wide which spans more groups so i think that this moment in time is fundamental so that people can come together and begin to seriously discuss this and so define robust interventions with the existing support so that over the next few days we can look at this group and carry out these interventions and see what the cost benefit is with so that we can cover this group across our national territory thank you very much for your question okay thank you very much uh, dr Sitan. we have another question that would be for adelaide uh, at unfpa Adelaide, after the experience of integrating the Erwinesh game as part of the Rapa Liga Bish, what lessons or advice would you give to other programs that are trying to build and provide a more comprehensive set of actions to address the various needs of adolescents around topics such as sexual and reproductive health, nutrition and hygiene, etc.? Thank you very much for the question. I think I will answer it in Portuguese. Uh, Eu penso que, em termos de, de, de aconselhamento na, na melhor abordagem... Thank you very much for the question. When it comes to implementing these programs and the advice that I could give, I would take the Rapariga Bees as a role model. Why is that? Because of its holistic nature. If we think back to the uh, presentation of Dr. Morris, he says that regardless of the type of approach that you want to implement when it comes to nutrition, we really have to understand where we find this adolescent, this young person. Are they at school? Are they in the community? And so on and so forth. So where do these young people find themselves? Thanks to the Rapariga Bees, we can use this holistic nature. We can implement it in community, in media, and at school. 
We talked about the SMS biz platforms, but there are many other platforms that can be used. The most important matter, therefore, is to approach this complex nature and this holistic nature and integrate new, the nutritional elements. But it doesn't have to be limited to the nutritional elements. It can also integrate other ones. In this case, the nutritional one does focus on nutritional and on sexual reproductive health. That being said, this type of structure, which involves media, community at large, cannot be used for other elements because these are simply the tools to spread knowledge. This is where we find these adolescents. Moreover, I would like to mention the government's hand when it comes to your initiatives. When we speak of governance, then it's not only the federal government, but we have administrative governance, we have local governance, etc., etc. So we really need to find these bridges between the different areas and leverage them. And then last but not least, let's not forget the importance of involving adolescents. For a program to be effective, we need to speak with adolescents where they are. At school, obviously, it's easier because they're all there outside of school, then we have to use the synergies in the community to talk to these adolescents and go to the different events that the communities organize. And these are the perfect way of approaching adolescents and by creating synergies or to use another terms, maybe term, um, themes or topics. It can be sexual and reproductive health, health in general, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the fora and tools that can be used to talk and integrate these different elements in the programs. And so I believe that the Raparegabiz can be used as a role model and then duplicated in other things. So again, ask all of our um, Presenters, if you see some questions in the Q&A box that you can respond to in writing, please go ahead and do so. Um, the time of the webinar is uh, coming close to an end, and we know that you all have very busy schedules. Therefore, I would like now to move on to the closing uh, of our webinar with some key reflections on the main points that we have learned and also some suggestions uh, for the way forward. So first of all, what have we learned? Uh, I believe there are some three key uh, takeaways from today's webinar. One is that adolescents have unique nutritional needs, but also the way that we engage on adolescent nutrition is unique and how we engage. For example, it is quite different from how we do nutrition programming for infants and young child nutrition. The co-creation that we saw with the um, Erwinash game, for example, and the participation of the adolescents in the program is essential for success in improving adolescent nutrition. The second thing that we have learned is that there is already considerable momentum in the ponto é que já tem um movimento em Moçambique para priorizar as adolescentes, sobretudo com saúde empowerment and economic empowerment. Uh, Nadia, would you like to conclude? I think we lost Dorothy again. If you don't mind just saying a few concluding words and then we can uh, close the webinar. Thank you, Nadia. I think my colleague Zineb will do the conclusion on oh, behalf I of see. Dorothy. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. So if Zineb would like to conclude, please uh, do so. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, um, I'm sorry that Dorothy's connection um, um, is not working very well. So I think um, the main point uh, Dorothy was mentioning about the key learnings, um, mainly that we know that the nutritional needs of adolescent girls are great for their own health 
and that of their future children. But we must not forget the adolescent boys in terms of their own nutritional needs and also their role as future fathers. So the participation of girls and boys in the design and development of comprehensive programs will be a long-term benefit. So I'm just checking if my colleague Dorothy is back to the connection. Debbie, is Dorothy back? Uh, I'm just checking, I'm not sure. She's not back yet, Zineb, I'm sorry. Okay, so, so basically through our discussions, um, I mean, our question is, what is the way forward? And uh, um, here are some potential next steps that we are thinking about. Um, for example, Dr. Sital mentioned in his presentation the need of an adolescent nutrition strategy and perhaps a technical working group to lead its development and a related action plan in Mozambique. So this strategy would need to align with existing related strategies and action, and action plans. Um, for example, the, the PAMRDC action plans. Um, but also as a next step and along the way, we must remember the importance of generating and sharing evidence on what works through operational research, evaluation of pilot programs and approaches. So there are also important lessons to learn from other countries as well. So we must keep our eyes and ears and conversations open with regional and global partners and conversations and opportunities for information sharing. And finally, um, we must broaden, you know, how we engage on adolescent nutrition. And like uh, what Leonor mentioned and Adelaide mentioned, it is clear from today's presentation that adolescent nutrition cannot be limited to the health sector and vertical interventions such as iron folate supplement for adolescent girls, for example. So globally and in Mozambique, um, there is a good experience and lessons learned on taking a systems approach with the health system, the food system, the education system, and so on. So this has been done for the stentin or a thousand days agenda, and we must think similarly with the co-participation of these girls and boys themselves about how we can improve adolescent nutrition in Mozambique. So. Um, these are the concluding remarks. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. And please stay on the line for a short video from the organizers. After the video, the webinar will be concluded.